Good morning, church. Welcome to worship service today. Can you believe that we are here? We're all gathered wherever we are across the Treasure Valley in our homes. Maybe some of you are in, in a small group. Um, maybe you're on a phone. Maybe you're watching on your TV. But we're here as the body of Christ, as a church family, to worship God this morning, despite all the stuff that's going on. So Let's open up our service in a word of prayer, and then we're going to sing a song and just give our praise to God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for a beautiful morning, another day, another Sunday, the first day of the week to come into your presence with thanksgiving, with joy, um, knowing that you are in charge of everything, that you've got this, and uh, that you love us with an unending love. Father, as we worship you wherever we are this morning, I pray that we would feel your presence, your abiding presence would be magnified in our hearts, in our lives, in our homes, or in our car, God, that we would just sense your Holy Spirit that you promised to send that is our peace this morning. Um, and we just pray that if there's anyone that is watching this that is feeling nervous, that has fear this morning, that your perfect love would cast out that fear. God, if there's anyone here that doesn't know you, that is watching right now, that, that they would have a desire to learn more about you and to come into that relationship with you. Um, and we just pray for that. And God, just give us an amazing worship service right now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. me out of the desert, brought me into his streams, river of living water, turned my bitter into sweet, all my burdens I lifted, he took the shackles off my feet, and there's no sound about it then, the captive set free, so let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Sing of His promises evermore. Pour out Your thankfulness. Let it overflow. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. My soul, there is life worth living Cause he calls me his own There's a hallelujah I've seen victory And there's no sound louder than Captive set free No, there's no sound louder than Captive set free So let the redeemed of the Lord say so Promises evermore. For all your faithfulness, let it all fall. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. You are my deliverer. You are my deliverer, you are my promises, singing out. You are my deliverer, the freedom I'm living in. You are my deliverer, you are my promises. Oh, you are my deliverer, the freedom I'm living in. God, you are my deliverer, you are my promises. One more time, oh, you are my deliverer. I'm living in God, you are my deliverer You are my promised land So let the ring of the Lord sing so Sing of His promises evermore For I 
Well, look forward to seeing the Lord and uh, meeting all his hands to save the rest of Katie's life and Chris Jim and all Chris Jim for the work of Katie, for the many years that she's gone, and long prayer, and looking at God's word. It's just a couple of things that we want you to be aware of. And uh, before I get to that, I, I was thinking this morning about uh, I was going to be like your dad, wear my shoe down. And then I decided that Spider Man might be a little too tight. So <laughs> and study or use if you're meeting with a life group. So keep that in mind. And then also, a lot of you are accustomed to giving as you leave the sanctuary. And since you won't be leaving the sanctuary this morning, you can give online, and a lot of you have already been doing that. If that's difficult for you, you can also send it by mail to the church address, 4440 East Columbia Road, and that's in Meridian 83642. So we're looking forward to the worship service as we get back into singing and worshiping him and the words there on the bottom of the screen so you're able to take part in that. And we just uh, love the fact that you can be with your families together or maybe some of you in some home groups or, or meeting with your neighbors and worshiping the Lord this morning. So let's pray and, um, and just continue to worship God wherever you are. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, I pray that as we sing these songs and as we listen to your word, that, that we would just be touched all the way to our hearts this morning, that we would understand with greater measure just how incredible your joy, your peace, your love, your goodness is and that we would praise you in the middle of what seems to be such a rocky storm in our country. We just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope, with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested in my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remained. Orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested in my life, began. Oh, your grace, so free, washes all the your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new, now life begins with you. Release from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom.
We're going to be transitioning here in the sanctuary a little bit as uh, some of you are gathered around with family and others in a smaller group. We're going to make our own little small group here. So while they're moving things around a little bit, I would like to lead you in a time of uh, what we call guided prayer around here. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 6, starting with verse 31, as we look at our guided prayer time this morning. So if you'll turn there with me, thinking about how God takes care of us, and a lot of us may, might be a little bit anxious. In, in this chapter, it's Jesus talking, and he's gone through how God takes care of all of his people and all of our needs. He takes care of the birds of the air and the flowers in the field and how much more he cares about us. And so we're picking it up sort of at the end of that. And in verse 31, he says, Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And so this morning, as we go towards a guided prayer, the first area I would like you to be thinking about is, uh, what are you anxious about today? And let's just take just, just a minute and just whatever that thing is that you're anxious about today, or maybe several things, lift it up to God and ask him to help help you in that area. Let's pray.
And the next area, and we're going to be talking about this more today, but just right now, what are you focused on? Think about what you're focused on. Are you focused on God? Are you focused on, as, as Jesus shares here in Matthew, what you will eat or drink or where, where those needs that we all have? Tell God about it this morning, the things that are overwhelming you, and ask him to help you seek him first and to help you to trust him with all of those things. And finally, that last statement that he says, therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself, sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Give tomorrow to God be, and so that we can be fully in this moment and in this day that we're living today, wherever you find yourself. God wants us to be fully in that day, trusting him. Turn tomorrow over to God. Father, I pray that you would help us order our thoughts and our efforts, Father. Order them so that you truly are first, that we seek you first. Lord, recognizing that you will help us, you will provide for our needs, you will even order the rest of the things in our lives when we come to you first, God, that the power of who you are will pour into us and through us. And help us, Father, in the needs of today and lead us into tomorrow. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we're the gathering here like you are gathering wherever you find yourself this morning. We are going to be in Romans uh, chapter 8 here in just a little bit. I've got a, a few opening comments that I would like to make, make before we get there. Uh, the first of which is that when I was thinking about uh, recovering from cancer, um, I did not picture my first message to the congregation being in this kind of setting. So uh, it's, it's kind of interesting to be here today, but uh, it's a privilege to be able to share God's word with everyone this morning, both you guys sitting here with me. Uh, thank you for leading us in worship this morning. Uh, that's really awesome. And then all of you out there in, in different places in the valley. So a little bit different. Um, today we're going to, out of Romans chapter 8, we're going to be looking at focusing on hope. That where do we find our focus in life and, and uh, especially in the times that we're in? And I just want to allude, I, I had uh, back in early January, I woke up at about four in the morning and had two different outlines for messages, and those have kind of been adapted. But uh, one of the things that I thought about was that as, uh, as I found out that I had cancer in late September, one of the first things as I had time to reflect on was that I wasn't going to ask the question, Why? Um, I've walked through a lot of difficult things with a lot of different people. And uh, when you begin to dwell on and focus on the question of why, it really takes your focus off of God and what's, what he wants to do in that moment, you know, and in those moments and in that struggle. And uh, so 
God just gave me a piece that just uh, in my mind one day, I think we were actually coming out of the doctor's office sitting in a car and, and I was just like, I'm not going to ask why. And I, th- I feel like that's a huge blessing that God gave me to just really have that and hold on to that. Um, and really, when you think about the question of why, it can become as uh, people of my mom and dad's generation, they would call that going down a rabbit hole, right? It ju- you just get deeper and deeper in the rabbit hole, but you really don't find the answer that you're looking for when you do that. And you got to shift your focus to something else. So this morning, I really want us to be focusing on hope. Really, the key is to putting our trust in God and, and exercising faith that God is in control even when we're going through a struggle. Um, because even the things that we know, maybe from Scripture or that we've learned and God's really uh, guided us in, we, there's still so much that we don't know and we don't understand. We might know of it, but we don't fully understand him. And so that question of why, uh, just really quickly, like for me, and this is definitely not all encompassing because there have been people for generations and eons wrestling the question of why do bad things happen to good people? Why are we going through the struggle we're going through? We're not going to address that today, but there's a couple things that I think are important for us to think of. First of all, that we live in a fallen world. Um, And when you look at that, if you've ever thought to yourself, the world should be different, then when you look at the beginning in Genesis, you can know that God made the world different. And it's through what we as believers, as Christians call, and and you can look at Genesis 3, we're not going to read all that today. It's what we call the fall. It changed everything away from how God had created it into what we experience today. And the fall of man brought uh, so much. It brought sin into this world. And it means that our gene pool is continuing to decline. It means that illness came in. It means that there were weeds to have to deal with in your garden and all those kind of things. Uh, Paul in Romans chapter 5 he, he kind of gives us a little bit of a summary of what sin entering into the world really did. In Romans 5, uh, verse, I'm going to read verse 12 and 14. Um, Just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. And then verse 14 says, Death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. Sin, once sin came into the world, we were all born into sin. We were born in a fallen state. And uh, sin really, that original sin brought spiritual death. And when we think about that and how that impacts our lives, it it sets up the whole promise that God said that he, he, he laid out a plan so that we could be spiritually alive. And so we want to really focus this morning on that. The other basic thing that I want us to think about with that question of why is that God is sovereign. And that's probably the one that actually causes some of us more trouble than anything. Uh, like in my situation, did God give me cancer? And I go back to, we live in a fallen world. Now, I don't think God gave me cancer, but cancer came into my life. And the, and the question is, will I focus on God whichever way that turns out, or will I focus just on that I have cancer and why, right? Uh, God's sovereignty, you can see in Revelations 21, 6. Uh, and he said to me, it is done. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. Or in other words, God is all encompassing. Anything that we know, anything and beyond what we know, God is in charge of. In Colossians 1, 16 through 17, he, um, Paul says, For by him all things were created, in him and on earth, visible and invisible. And this him here is really talking about Jesus. Jesus is God, right? All things were created through Jesus, whether visible or invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. That's that's amazing. In him, in Christ, in God, all things are held together. It might not be in the way that we want it to be all the time, but God is holding all things together and he is rolling out his plan. And we see that uh, really clearly in that he promised the Messiah. The Messiah came and he accomplished what he wanted to do. And we'll look at that here in a minute. And, and then he, his plan continues. Christ will come back one day and we will reign with him. 
In Romans 11, 33 and 35, it says, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. That really taught, I mean, he, is, he reigns over, sovereign. He reigns over all things, right? How unsearchable are his judgments and inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? God doesn't need a counselor. He is our counselor. He actually, the Holy Spirit is with us to be our counselor and our guide through life and we should rely on him. Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? There's nothing we can do to repay God for all the things that he has done for us. So God's sovereignty is in that question of why. God is outside of us. We cannot hope to know all of him. He is supremely above us. And sometimes I think as humans, that's, that's what we wrestle with the most, is truly how supremely above us that he is. Um, in Philippians, Paul gives us perspective about this. What are we going to focus on? And I just want to read this. It's uh, chapter 3, verses 8 through 14. Just, just get the heart of what Paul is talking about here and his focus. Where is it? Just kind of think as I read. Where is his focus? Or you could turn there if you wanted to. Uh, Philippians 8, 3, 8 through 14. He says, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. That's a focus. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I may have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. It's that focus. What are we pressing on towards? And Paul says, upward to the call of God in Christ Jesus, right? And he's so singularly focused on that. It's, I mean, it's a beautiful picture of how Paul is just abiding and, and seeking God. So as we think about focus, what are you focused on today? Are you focused on hope? Is, is, is what you're focused on providing hope to you, you know, for you. And uh, we think about what we will focus on. A lot of times as we think about that question, we have to be honest that sometimes we focus on whether we will live or die. Uh, other times it's whether we will be financially stable. And then other times it's about achieving our dreams. We have these dreams that we want to accomplish in this world. And, and, uh, those dreams aren't always necessarily in line with what God has for us. So we think about what are we really focused on? So in Romans 8, um, chapter 31 through 39, I think we find a really good kind of uh, summation and outline of both the gospel and also the, the things that can get us off, get our focus off of the hope that we have in Christ. Um, there's another person that Sherry and I knew and some people in the church um, still would would know her and probably were at her memorial service. She, she was another person who faced cancer. She was young. She was 27. Um, her name was Jen. And, uh, when she had me come and meet with her when they'd moved to Texas even. And, uh, and when she asked me to be there, I knew what it was for. She asked me to come and help plan her memorial service. And as we were, as she was sharing what she wanted in her memorial service, she looked right at me, right in my eyes. And she said, wear a blue suit. She, she like banned me from wearing anything black. And she said, let everybody else not wear black, right? And you start to get a hint of like where her focus was. It wasn't on that she was dying, but that she would be with Christ. And she wanted people to have that perspective, right? That this isn't mourning, but instead of celebration that she was with her savior. And so she said, you have to wear a blue suit. Thankfully I had a blue suit. And, uh, 
she told us, she said, and eat dessert first, right? And the perspective there was eat dessert first because you don't know how long you're going to live and you might as well eat the good stuff first, right? And so that was her perspective. Uh, but she also told me to, she said, I want you to use Romans 8 to share with the people who come uh, to my memorial service because in Romans 8, there's hope. Uh, there's just such a great picture of hope and I want people to see the hope that I have and, and, and hopefully they'll, they'll have that hope. And uh, praise the Lord, I can tell you that there were several people that came to know Christ out of her memorial service. So it was really awesome. So I learned a lot from knowing Jen before she had cancer. Uh, she's an amazing young woman. And I learned a lot as she went through cancer. And she, she asked me to come and meet with her. And I knew what she was going to say. She, was, she asked me right off the bat, why? And, um, but eventually, her focus completely changed. And she was such a blessing to everyone that knew her and a lot of teenage girls that were in Sherry's group with her. But so... Uh, so that's kind of my background looking at Romans 8. It, uh, it means a lot to me. And we're, we're starting kind of later on in verses 31 through 34. And, and here we're going to see, we're, we're just going to do it in pieces. 31 through 34 really talks about the gospel. And we find here that God is for us. So let's read this uh, 31 through 34 together. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will we, how will he not also, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. And so as we look at those verses, it's God is for us. I mean, we need to really, really like anchor in on God is for us. And how, how do we see that? You can look all over scripture. We're going to look in this in just a minute, but we know that God gave and, and a lot of people who don't even go to church know John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, that means anyone who calls on him will have eternal life, right? So we see that in John 3.16 and we see it here. He provides for us. God provides for us. And the most important thing that God provides for us, he provides in all kinds of ways, but the most important thing that God provides for us is a way to know him, to be one with him again back to the way that he originally created that we talked about in Genesis, back to that perfect thing that he created, that we would be in relationship with him. It, and the question here is, if God justifies, that means puts you in right standing with him, then who can condemn? No one. If God justifies you and makes you right with him, puts you in right relationship with him, then who can condemn you? No one. Because we already established that God is sovereign, right? He's in control of all things. So no one can condemn you. If you look at verse 34, it's just a summary. Who is it to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. Jesus died with our sins on him. He willingly took our sins on himself. And we're actually going to be looking in the next two weeks about the heart of Jesus as he walked through that last week going towards the cross, right? And he took that on willingly. And then he rose from the dead to live eternally. Well, who can offer you eternal life? Only the one who is living eternal life, right? So Jesus can offer you eternal life. And then we see in here that he sits with God. Once he accomplished what he was set out to do, what God wanted him to do, then now he sits with God. And this is awesome. He intercedes for us, right? He intercedes. He intervenes in our sentence. We were sentenced to death because of our sin, but Jesus solved that sin problem, and now he intercedes for us and proclaims us innocent, pure, and righteous. And I think sometimes we have a hard time looking at ourselves that way, right? We know the mistakes we make, but, but once we're with Christ, once we're his, every mistake we make, he goes, it's already paid. It's already paid. He gives us this freedom to be able to live more freely than we could ever live in any other way. And in, uh, in verse 35, as you think about God is for us, he, it asks this question here in verse 35, 
Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? That's a great question, right? We already really established no one, but then look at all of these things. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. It's who can separate us? Well, no one, we said, and no thing, no thing, no matter what we're going through, can separate us from God's love. And it's and not the struggles, as you look at this list, not the struggles of the world. It doesn't say that we won't face struggles, which I think sometimes that's what the answer we want. Well, if you just know Jesus, then you won't have struggles. That's, that's not a scriptural uh, concept, right? It's if you know God, he will strengthen you and carry you through. And no matter what happens, you know that you will be with him, right? And so we, we got to get God's perspective so that we can have hope. So tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword. I mean, we don't think about swords that much anymore, but uh, boy, back in days before, the reality was that many people died in battle, right? And then as you look at 36 and uh, uh, 36, and then I didn't finish 37, it says, uh, as for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We were regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No one in all these things, no in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And when I read that, I was like, we are more than conquerors. Well, the, the, it brought up the question of how. If you're being killed all day long, if you're facing all these things, how are we more than conquerors, right? Because in the, in the physical world and in the human world, if if I, if I were to die, then people would go, well, you didn't conquer anything, right? Because we're so, phys- we're so focused on like physical life and death and those kind of things. And God's trying to open our minds up to that there's a lot more going on, a lot more going on. Just like uh, Pastor Nathan this morning when we were praying and we were thinking about worshiping and it's just us here worshiping and to be able to then think about everybody else worshiping with us, Right. And then Pastor Nathan said, but remember, there are angels among us worshiping also. I mean, that's that little hint of like when God, God's perspective is completely different than ours. Ours is so physically focused. So how are we more than conquerors? We are more than conquerors through Christ, the one who saves. And that's where our focus has to be. And that's where focus on hope Where else can we find hope that overrides any kind of trial that we face? Even death, but in Christ, because Christ conquered death. So in verse 38, let's look, let's read through verse 38. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And my question for everyone this morning is, what are you certain of with God? When you think about knowing God, what is it that you're certain of because you know him? Uh, Are you certain that the love of God through Christ Jesus reigns over all of these things? That's where hope comes from. When, you, when you're certain that the love of Christ reigns over all this list, let's look at this list. We talked quite a bit about physical death. Are you certain that Christ's love rules over physical death, that you are spiritually alive and you will live forever with him? Are you certain? Like my friend Jen was. And then life. I mean, there's death and life. You know, he's got all these comparisons, right? Death and life. What about life? Are you certain that the love of Christ can reign over the issues that you're facing in life? Because those sometimes really weigh on us very heavy. They get our focus really distracted, don't they? The issues in life. Uh, He brings up spiritual beings. I mean, which is, you know, there's angels and there's demons and Satan exists. Those things exist. Are you certain that Christ reigns over those? You look at scripture and see that he definitely does because he commanded them to come out of people and, and they were afraid of him, right? So he definitely reigns over them. And then, what about powers, earthly rulers? Like, are we confident that the people who are in ruling positions actually they're there because God allowed that? And sometimes they don't do things we think they should. 
And sometimes they even make our life hard. But do we recognize that God's plan is continuing to unfold and he's the one in charge of those? And then the struggles of today. I mean, that kind of goes with that life thing I was talking about. Struggles of today, well, we can all identify with the coronavirus, right? I mean, everything in your life is turned upside down, right? Can't go here, can't go there, right? And a lot of people won't even meet in this kind of a group and, and all these kind of things, right? Maybe you don't have a job or you're having to work at home and all kinds of things, right? So struggles of today are very real. The, the coronavirus, what it's creating, economic stress, broken relationships. Does God, does Jesus, his love reign over broken relationships? What about the rise of anxiety and depression in our world and in our culture? Is It's just skyrocketed, right? Does, does, can Christ's love reign over those things? I mean, I know I've struggled with the, some of those things before at different times in my life, right? And it can be really difficult, but does God reign over those even? Um, what about loss? When you suffer loss in your life, does, does Christ reign over those? And then the next one is, what about the future? You know, the verse that we started with today, Matthew 6, 34, or, six, or chapter 6 and then verse 34, he says, therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow. I think a lot of us right now are anxious about tomorrow. And here Christ is saying, don't be anxious about tomorrow because I'm going to take care of your needs. And he says, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And I've heard a lot of people talking about, and I've noticed in my neighborhood, I don't know about your neighborhood, that there's some kind of cool things going on. Families spending more time together, sitting out on their front porch and waving at you when you walk by, or they're walking by your front porch. And just there's kind of this uh, different kind of connectedness. It's a slower pace. And those are good things. So we need to look at the good things that are coming out of, out of what's going on. James, um, he says that, takes that idea and says it in a different way in chapter 4, 13 through 15. He says, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. We have no idea what tomorrow will bring, really, right? There's a lot of speculation about it, but we don't really know. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. And here, just that shift back on, if the Lord wills, you know, what am I focused on? Where do I find my hope? And right, even in that phrase, it's, if the Lord wills, where's the focus? It's on the Lord. What is, what is God willing in my life right now? And will I put my hope and trust in him in the midst of that thing? As we continue to go down the list, there's powers, things bigger than you. We've already established that God, there's nothing bigger than God right? He's sovereign over everything beyond our imagination even. So we can turn that over to him. This, these next two, neither height nor depth. I, I, has anybody else like read through that? And when you, as you read through it, you know, you kind of read, uh, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else. And you just kind of skip over that because you kind of don't really, never stopped. It was so cool when I was studying this this week that God just goes, wait a second, what does that mean? And then he goes, that means the height, the high points in your life. Does the, can, can God's love reign over the high points of your, your life? So many times when life is good, it's when we lose our focus on God because everything's good. We don't have to rely on him and we kind of become self-sufficient. But in the height of our lives at the high points, can Jesus reign over those two? Can we keep our focus on him and actually, that's, we can glorify him, right? Praise him instead of just getting distract, distracted thinking, oh, I've got this, right? And then when you look at depths, that's the low points. And, and that's already been kind of, kind of outlined earlier in this chapter. But the low points of life, the struggles, the adversity, and even disgrace that comes into life sometimes. Sometimes it's at those points that we focus the most on God because there's no place else to turn. But sometimes all we do is focus on the problem, right? Our focus isn't on hope of what God might be doing and is leading us in, but our focus becomes on just the problem. And I, I think right now we see a lot of examples of that, that a lot of people are struggling. They just focus on the coronavirus and am I going to get it? And what's that going to do? And all these kind of things. But yet 
the coronavirus is just one piece of life. We can, we can raise our eyes and we can look to God and find our focus on him and how he wants us to interact and help other people and how he's going to provide our needs. Remember in Matthew, he says that I, how much more important are you than all these other things? And I'm going to supply your needs. I mean, we need to look for how he's doing that. Is there anything in this world that could separate us from God's love? I, I thought immediately of John 19, 30, when Jesus was hanging on the cross and he's dying for our sins. And in that last hour, what does Jesus say? He says, as he received the sour wine, he said, it is finished, right? It is finished. What, he, what God sent Jesus here to do, that plan was finished. So is there anything in the world that could separate us from him? No, absolutely not because he finished it. And if we know Jesus and he knows you, he'll never leave you. And John 10, 27 through 30 is just a beautiful thing where Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. You know, are you one of his sheep this morning? Do you know him personally? He says, I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. There, there it is again, right? The sovereignty of God, the, the immensity of God. He's greater than all. And no one is able, no one, no thing is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one, right? If we know Jesus, if we understand like all he accomplished on the cross and that he's offering us eternal life and we focus on that, we have hope and Nothing, not even you can snatch you out of his hand, right? I mean, that's so amazing. I think sometimes we think, well, if I do this or I do that, then, then I'm no longer his sheep. That's not true, right? Once you're his, you're always his. So what will you focus on is the question. Right now, today, spending some quiet time and really reflecting and, and offering like we started with the guide of prayer today, offering up the things that you're anxious about, the things that are distracting you and taking your focus and just saying, no, I'm going to spend some time today and I'm going to really focus on God. I'm going to focus on the hope that he has provided. We realize that we all face difficult times. And today in, in the world, not just our nation, but in the world, we are all sharing in a difficult time. Of, it's uncertain, right? And everything's uncomfortable because we're having to make adjustments. And it, it really shows us really maybe how comfortable we are. But what will we choose to focus on? Because we have a choice, right? So let's pray and then we'll end with a really great song, I think, uh, today. So let's pray. Father, thank you that our hope is in you, that we can refocus on you and you will put things into perspective. Father, thank you that you provide for us and that, Lord, um, it doesn't matter all the way from just um, a, a little struggle to anxiety or depression. Lord, um, even if we face death, physical death, Lord, nothing can remove us from you. Nothing is greater than you. And I pray that we would focus on that, God. We ask, Lord, that you would be with the world. This world that you created and what's going on uh, is no surprise to you. But will we, will we turn? Will we lift up our face to you? Will, will your people stop and pray and ask you, Lord, for deliverance? Will we be the people who recognize that you are greater than all things? Father, I pray you would warm our hearts and uh, realign our hearts. Help us, Father, to um, just have our focus sharply, keenly tuned to you. Thank you, God, for the gift of Jesus, all that he accomplished in your plan, Lord. And we look forward to the rest of your plan that one day Jesus will return and we'll be with you in a way that we haven't experienced yet, God. And we praise you and thank you. We look forward to that, though it's beyond our imagination. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
tries to hide and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God? Sing with me. Thanks for joining us today, and I hope that you can be secure for this next week knowing how great his love is for us, how great our God is, and that there's nothing, there's no one, and there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. I hope you know him today. If you don't, would you just say this prayer with me right here, right now? Father God, we know that you are the creator. You created us. We talked about earlier how when you set things up, we were good. We are good. But then sin entered the world, and with that sin, we fell. And we see the destruction of that all around us. But God, I am here today to recognize that even though I have sinned, that you've provided the solution for that sin in Christ Jesus and in his love that he demonstrated that while we were still sinners, he died for us. He, he gave up his life and he took on our sin on the cross so that we can come into that right relationship with you. So we just recognize that this morning and we give over our lives to you. And we say, you come first because we can't do this on our own. We can't face these fears and anxieties on our own, we'll just fall. But if we trust in you, we know that we'll have eternal life and that you've conquered death. So there's, we don't have to worry about our eternal 
salvation. We don't have to worry about what will happen when we die. And we don't have to worry about what will happen in this life right now with what's going on, even with as we look at the world around us. And so we just take this time right now to say, we trust in you for our salvation, you alone, Jesus Christ. Thank you. And um, we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, um, would you uh, maybe write something in the comments below on YouTube um, and, and reach out to us and let us know? You can call the church office at 208 362 2620. Um, we'd love to talk to you. Our, our church office is open. Or you can email us at office at 10milechurch.org. Or if you want to email me, it's uh, Nathan at 10milechurch.org. Or Pastor Ben is Ben at 10milechurch.org. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, we hope you have a great week.